So we have been um, focusing this uh, Lent season. Our theme has been One Jesus, Many Expressions. And the, and the purpose of that is uh, to help us hold our, underst- our personal understanding of who Jesus is and what he's done, to hold it a bit more lightly uh, so that we can take in other perspectives and then with all of that be able to enrich our understanding of who Jesus is, what he really did, and what he desires to do in our lives. And so uh, our passage today, it's actually very familiar. It's uh, the parable of the prodigal son, but it's actually very poorly named uh, because when we say the prodigal son, our mind goes directly to the younger son, the prodigal son. But it's really about the father's love. And so many and other cultures as well, other um, people, actually call this the compassionate father, the parable of the compassionate father or the forgiving father. And this morning we're going to look at it uh, through the expression of a painting by Rembrandt from the 17th century. And this is a painting that he did toward his life. And, uh, and through um, the expression of Henry Nouwen, who was a 20th century Catholic. And he actually wrote a book, which I actually forgot to bring, but he wrote a book, it's about this thick, and uh, All right, thank you. Are you turning, switching it, or? I'm good, okay. All right. Okay, so this is from Luke 15. And the first, first three verses of Luke um, sets the context for the parable. And I believe this will be on the screen, is that correct, Tavis? But just to warn you, I changed the tenses, so it's not going to be exactly what it's on screen. And I just kind of add things as I go through it, rather than read it and then explain things later. So I kind of talk a little bit as I read the scripture. So um, if you prefer, I won't feel offended if you actually close your eyes and simply take it in and imagine. Try to put yourself into the parable. And imagine where you might find yourself in the parable. So the first three verses. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus goes on to tell three parables in response to the Pharisees' challenge. And all of the parables, all three, have the same theme, seeking what is lost and the great joy that that happens when what is lost is found. And this morning we'll focus on the third of these parables, the compassionate father. As I go through the parable, ask yourself where you would place yourself in this story. Jesus begins, there is a man who has two sons. The younger one says to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So the father divides his property between them. It's very clear that the family is well off. Today, very likely a middle to upper class kind of family, a family with money, property, assets. The younger son is self-centered and greedy. He shows disrespect and disregard for his parents. And all he cares about is what they can do for him. But the father doesn't argue. He simply divides the state 
between his two sons. And as tradition dictates, the elder son gets two-thirds, and the younger son gets one-third. Not long after this, the younger son gets together all he has. He converts his assets and property into money, and he sets off for a distant country, and there squanders his wealth in wild living. This brash, self-centered, cocky child leaves home, breaking all ties with his family, and he flees from responsibility associated with the lifestyle, values, and faith of his father. He figures he doesn't need his father's love. He can make it on his own. He knows better than his father, and he figures it's his right to live whichever way he wants to. Not sure if any of that sounds familiar to any of us. After he spends everything, there is a severe famine in that whole country, and he begins to be in need. So he hires himself out to a citizen of that country who sends him to his fields to feed pigs. He longs to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs are eating, but no one gives him anything. All his relationships were based on what he could get out of people or what they could get out of him. Now there's nothing left, and nobody cares or thinks about, any, about him anymore. He's become invisible, alone. He hits bottom doing the worst job imaginable. Coming to his senses, he says, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. Comes to his senses. He realizes how good he had it. His eyes are opened. The moment of repentance, as Pastor Aaron talked about it last Sunday. Or, as Nowen puts it, he heard the faint echo of his father calling him home. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. He remembers that he is a son. That's his true identity, even though he doesn't deserve to be one. And so he gets up and starts the journey back to his father. He's a very different man, poor, humble, regretful. But while he is still a long way off, his father sees him and is filled with compassion for him. He runs to his son, throws his arms around him, and kisses him. No questions, no accusations, no punishment. He throws his arms around his son with joy and holds on tight. And the son says to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Notice he addresses him as father. He knows he doesn't deserve to be treated as such, but he is still aware that he is a son. But the father isn't listening to him. Father's love is all-encompassing and non-judgmental. The father says to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. The status of son is immediately made clear. That is how the father sees him, whether the son deserves it or not. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And so they begin to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son is in the field. When he comes near the house, he hears music and dancing. So he calls one of the servants and asks him what is going on. Your brother has come, he replies, and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has him back safe and sound. But the older brother becomes angry and refuses to go in. He becomes resentful and jealous. And so his father goes out to him and pleads with him. 
Notice the father goes out to both of his sons. The father takes the initiative. He loves both his children and longs to have them home with him. But the elder son answers his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even one young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you killed a fatted calf for him. He's so angry, he doesn't even acknowledge the younger son as a brother. It's your son, this son of yours. It's not fair. I deserve better. I deserve more than your disobedient son. I've always done what I should. I've been treated shabbily. He compares his treatment to that of his younger brother and feels that his father loves him less. How often do we compare ourselves to others and feel we are not treated rightly? My son, the father says, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. It's clear the father loves his elder son as much as his younger one. But the father continues, we have to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours He reminds the elder son that this is his brother. This brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. The parable ends here and we're left wondering what the older son will do. Will he too come to his senses? Have his eyes opened? Repent and make the journey home to be with his father? So far, the reading of God's word. What I want to do now is spend a little time looking at the painting, and it'll be on screen, I believe. And uh, all of you should have received. uh, uh, Did you, JB and Aaron, did you receive one? Yeah? There might be more in the back. So everybody should have received a painting, so you can look at that. You can look on screen. But you can also look there. Uh, I made some copies because I thought it would be a little easier to really look at it if you actually had a sheet in front of you. For those of you online, on your computer, it's probably pretty good. Up here, it is fairly light. Actually, it's too light in this room. So, um, I'm just going to check what time it is. Yeah, I don't know if I have time to, uh, to get all your input. I would love to be able to do that, but we are on a time limit. So uh, if there is something that you think I've missed when, as I go through it, just put your hand up and uh, I'll uh, call on you if, if I, you've thought of something that I haven't thought of, and I'm sure there's probably some things. So first of all, you will notice, if you look really close, the younger son is wearing tattered clothing, which differs greatly from the rich red of the fathers. The younger son is the one kneeling, right? The father is the one that um, has his hands on him. His head is shaved, one foot is bare, and the other has a broken shoe on it. These are signs of poverty and slavery even. This is someone, right, who has experienced rough living, He has done whatever he could to survive. Yet you'll notice his sword. And I don't know if you can tell. It's hard to tell on on the screen here. But if you look really close on the right-hand side, there's a sword. And I didn't actually notice this until I was reading the book by Henry Now. And he pointed it out. And I looked again. And I was like, oh, yeah, there is a sword there still. And that sword... The fact that he kept it is this idea that he still has the sense that he is a son. He didn't actually sell his sword, even though he was so desperate. That symbol of being a son. He's kneeling before his father, leaning, resting with his head on the father's stomach. On a, on his, if he was sitting, it would have been his lap, right? The son is home, finally, in his father's presence in the embrace of his arms. There's this sense of safety, 
of rest, of relief. And as I just looked at it this week and looked at it and just sat with it, it didn't take much to imagine the son just weeping, weeping with relief that he is home safe. Do you identify at all with the younger son? Do you long to be held in the arms of the father? Long to be completely loved, accepted, forgiven? Long to know you're safe at home and can rest from all the burdens you carry? I can identify with this longing. I can't identify with rough style of living. Maybe some of you can, but that's not something I've experienced. But my interior life has often been very tattered and rough. And so I can identify with this longing to be so completely loved and accepted. What about the older son? He's the man that's standing on the right-hand side. Uh, he's also wearing red. So it's a sign that he is from the family, right? A sign of being the son. He's tall and he's standing straight, stern. His hands are clasped in front of him, wearing this rich red cloak. He's got a, um, a staff of some kind he's holding on to. Clearly, he's someone of importance. And it looks like he thinks he's important as well. And he's not participating in the scene with the father and the younger son. You can just feel that disapproval emanating from him as he looks on in judgment of both brother and the father. There isn't a lot of physical space between the older son and the father in the painting, but you can just feel the huge gulf between the two. It's clear that the older might be physically home, but he's not emotionally and spiritually home. Do you identify with the older son at all? You know, for some reason, I don't mind so much when I feel I identify with the younger son. But to identify with the older son, I don't really like to admit that so much. And that's, I think, perhaps the reality is, is that I resemble the older son much more than the younger. I grew up in the church. I followed all the rules never really broke any rules. I've never even been completely and totally drunk. Tipsy a few times, maybe, but that's it. (laughs) And I didn't break any society rules other than maybe a few speeding tickets. I pay my taxes. I'm heterosexual. I have a solid marriage of 32 years. I give to charity. I work hard. Everything on the outside looks pretty good. Yet even just this past week, there have been numerous times I've caught myself being judgmental towards someone else, feeling hard done by for some reason, feeling jealous and resentful. Even just a small thing, like this morning, I was doing Wordle, you know, the New York Times Word thing. I don't know, how many of you do that? Know about it? Oh, yeah, a whole bunch of people. All right, so I was doing it this morning, and I do it, and John doesn't do it. So this morning, um, don't tell me what the word is. I haven't figured it out yet. So uh, yeah, yeah, I haven't figured it out yet. I still work on it. And uh, and so I just mentioned I was talking to John, and then he says, uh, yeah, he he grabs a dictionary, and he because he's not actually doing it, so he can do this, and. uh, And then he's like, oh, yeah, okay, that's the word I thought it was. And right away, I was like, really? So you think you're better than me because I can't, I have no idea what the word is. And you already, you was like, oh, yeah, this is what I thought it was, and it is. And I immediately felt like, oh, so you're saying you're better than me. And I was like, yeah, it doesn't take much to go down the road of the older son. (laughs) And that's just a very small thing. But, you know, it's that kind of thing 
that turns into huge divisions as we see in our society, as we see in the world, and it turns to wars. And it all starts because we think that the way we are treated is the only thing that we should care about. This is about me, not about the other. What do you notice about the father? The first thing I noticed is how still this whole image is. When I've read this parable in the past, and I've read it many, many times, I've always pictured the father running out to meet his son with great joy and exuberance, energy. It's very active. And the parable, when you read it, it is very active. And yet Rembrandt painted it in a very still way. And he's painted as an old man. Rembrandt did this at the end of his life. After he had lost his wife, two other women that he had lived with, I think three sons and two daughters. He was 63 when he died and he had lost all these people in his life. And it was toward the end of his life that he painted this picture. The father's painted as an old man, hunched over, possibly blind. He's not full of energy, running to throw his arms around his son and welcome him home. And he appears more serious than exuberantly joyful. The father is leaning over his son with his hands on his shoulders. And I found that as I sat with this painting, I found his posture and his expression evoked such a strong sense of the boundless love of the father. The father is so thankful to have his son home. And it's almost like I had this sense of waves of love coming off the father toward the son. Do you identify with the father? Do you see yourself as being the father? Oh, sorry, I missed one thing. You'll notice yet, if you look really close, uh, that the father's left hand is somewhat bigger and rougher. It kind of holds on a little bit more um, firmly. And the right hand appears smoother and more gentle. And that gives the suggestion that the father's love is both a father's love and a mother's love. That's the um, way that Henry Nouwen expressed it. And I looked at it and looked at it and I was like, you know, I can see that in that. So do you identify with the father? Do you see yourself as being the father? That's how Henry Nouwen put it. It kind of feels sacrilegious to me to, to say, you know, do you see yourself as being the father? I'm not God and no, there's no way I can ever be God love the way he does. Yet, I would suggest that most people in this room, perhaps not everybody, but most people in this room would claim that we are followers of Jesus. And Jesus' whole life and preaching had only one aim, to reveal this inexhaustible, unlimited, fatherly and motherly love of God the Father. And Jesus said, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. And love your enemies. Be compassionate as your Father is compassionate. And as I have loved you, so you must love each other. You know, I'm okay with identifying with the younger son, and I'll admit to identifying with the older son, even though I'd rather not. But to identify as the father, to simply put my arms around a person and love them. No strings attached. No judgment. Henry Nouwen suggests that to do this means growing up, maturing. Because it means loving those I disagree with, those I don't understand, those who've wronged me, those who've hurt others, others I love. 
It means praying and waiting for them to come home to the Father. Praying for all people, including world leaders, even Putin, rather than talking about how horrible a person he is. It means praying for the far right. And I find myself resisting. But now and suggests, and I would agree with him, that our families, our communities, our churches, our world doesn't need another younger son or another older son, whether we are converted and are followers of Jesus or not. What the world needs is a father who lives with outstretched arms, always desiring to let them rest on the shoulders of his returning children. A father, mother, who only blesses in endless compassion, asking no questions, always giving and forgiving, never expecting anything in return. This is what we're called to be. But we are not able to do this unless we let the rebellious younger son in ourselves and the resentful older son in ours come to our senses, have our eyes opened, repent, and come home to the Father through the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and to receive for ourselves the unconditional forgiving love that the Father offers us. And the more we come to know this unconditional love of the Father, the more we are able to mature into people who love as the Father loves. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, Father God, Holy Spirit, we pray, Lord, that as we as we prepare our hearts to receive communion, Lord's Supper, your Supper, Lord Jesus, the Supper that you gave to your disciples on the night that you were betrayed. Lord, help us to come to you in humility, recognizing both the younger and the older son in ourselves, And I pray, Lord, that we will come to you truly seeking to be transformed by you so that we can reflect more and more the love of the Father. Amen. So this morning we will be um, sharing communion together. And we are going to do this a little differently And I'll explain this first before I get into all of this. So what we've done since COVID started is give everybody a little COVID cup, what I call COVID cups, I don't know, sorry. Um, But this morning what we're going to do is uh, we, I'm going to ask Pastor Aaron to come up in a minute and uh, he will do the the juice. So once I go through the whole... um, communion words, I will say, I will ask you to form a line down the middle, and then I will give you uh, the bread and say, Christ's body broken for you, and you're welcome to take that, and then move to where Pastor Aaron will be, and he will give you the, uh, the cup, and, you say, and he will say, Christ's uh, blood poured out for you. You could take that, and then you could put your little cup in the garbage can in the corner over here and go back to your seat. Pastor Aaron and I will, um, I'll put my mask on um, to make it a little bit more comfortable uh, for people, and then we will also make sure that our hands are sanitized as well. So hopefully everyone will feel comfortable participating. And so here at Avenue Church, we do practice what we call an open table. This means that all who believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior, all who long to come home to the Father through Jesus Christ. All who are walking toward Jesus Christ. 
all those who acknowledge their inability to love as the Father loves on their own are welcome to take part. And if you find that you're not at this point in your journey, that is completely okay. You're welcome just to remain in your seat and um, reflect and meditate. So come to this table. You have much faith and you who would like to have more. You who have been to the sacrament often and you who have not been for a long time. You who have tried to follow Jesus and you who have failed. Come. It is Christ who invites us to meet him here. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and after giving thanks to God, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. I invite you now to come up, and we will serve you. Oh, and if you have children, children are welcome as well. Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice. You became nothing, poured up to death many times. I've wondered at your gift of life, and I'm in that place once again. And I'm in that place once again. Now you are exalted to the highest place, King of the heavens, one day I'll bow. But for now, I marvel at the saving grace, and I'm in that praise once again. And I'm full of praise once again. Cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you. Once again I pour out my life. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross.
Let's pray. Lord, you have put gladness in our hearts. You have satisfied our hunger with good things. In giving all, you have not withheld from us your own dear son. How can we withhold anything from you, our Lord and our God? Renew us day by day with the gift of your spirit that we may give ourselves completely to your service, that we may love others with the boundless love of the Father and walk with joy in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Following the service, I invite you to go next door here. There are some questions on the table, uh, pretty basic ones. Uh, who do you identify with? And how does it make you feel to uh, say that you identify with the Father? And then also, too, if you take your picture of the painting, there are some other people in the painting. And uh, who do you think those people might be represent in that, in the paintings? So I invite you to do that. And uh, yeah, if we can clear out of here so St. Face can get ready for their service. So I invite you to stand to receive God's blessing. Children of God, hear now these words of blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. All God's children say, Amen. Praise God from whom all.